Hey, Johnny here, and today I'm combining this ancient Japanese woodworking technique with some really rare wood that I had to source from over 2,000 miles away. I'm making a large dining table and inlaying hundreds of pieces of kamiko, which are patterns created with individually shaped strips of wood, pieced together to make decorative panels. I've seen Kamiko used in unique ways before, but I've never seen it done exactly like this. And first up, I've got to flatten these bookmatch pair of myrtle slabs over on the CNC. Now, you guys know that I live in the middle of the country in Oklahoma, and we're not really known for having the most unique variety of wood species. You can get red oak slabs here all day long. Walnut isn't too hard to find. There's also red oak, cottonwood, pecan, red oak, elm, and red oak. But beyond that, we really don't have access to unique woods. But up in the Pacific Northwest, there's a plethora of unique and highly figured wood species. So when I saw these slabs posted for sale up in Oregon, I had to have them. And while myrtle itself isn't exactly rare, the combination of figure and color on this pair of slabs makes them very uncommon and highly sought after. So snagging this pair plus shipping to Oklahoma for 2,500 bucks was a really good deal. And it was such a good deal that I let them sit around my shop for a year and a half, but I'm glad I did because I finally thought of the perfect project for these gorgeous slabs. And this table is going to be sold with 100% of the proceeds going to charity. Usually every year I build something for my wife for her big Christmas gift, but this year she doesn't get to keep the table as the gift is donating the money to the charity in her name. I think she thinks this table is going on our house, so stick around to the end to see how that plays out. We haven't even really done anything in this project and I'm already running into issues. I thought these slabs were really, really flat. Turns out this one right here is much more bowed along its length than this one. This one's actually came out pretty nice. They're both right now uh, flattened to right at the same thickness, which is about an inch and three quarter. And I really don't wanna go much less than that. These are almost 10 foot slabs. I think we should go ahead and get them cut down to eight foot because the shorter they are, the less pronounced that uh, bow is gonna be along the length. And then we can actually start putting this table together. A book matches a pair of slabs cut sequentially from the same tree and then laid out next to one another in a mirrored fashion. And I thought about incorporating these two voids on the end into the finished piece, but there was lots of rotten sections in this area, so instead I'll just cut these off and focus on those middle two voids. My plan here is to fill them with epoxy and inlay two Kamiko panels, and if you don't know what Kamiko is, I promise you by the time you get to the end of this video, you'll have a really good understanding. Kamiko is a very intricate process of piecing together small wood strips with with specific angles to create complex patterns. And while the process itself isn't difficult, it is very tedious and very time consuming to do it on this scale. And that's probably why I've never seen anyone inlay Kamiko in a live edge table like this before. I did the math and I had to cut up and inlay over 700 individual strips of wood. But before I can even start making the Kamiko, I need to join these two slabs together, which I'll do along that short peninsula of wood that sticks out in the middle of the slabs. So again, these myrtle slabs are rare because of the combination of the figure and color, especially all the burl along the edges. But this also means there are tons of weird bark inclusions and little nooks that I need to clean up and fill with epoxy later on. I'm using this big wire wheel to clean up the edges, and normally this would be a bit overkill. This is actually the wire wheel that I use for metalworking, but since I'm going to be pouring epoxy, I'm not really worried about the rough texture on those inside edges. These myrtle slabs were mostly in pretty good shape, but there are a few rotten sections and here you can see just how brittle and powdery the wood is. So I'm just going to power carve this section off and then I'll add a piece to fill this in before I pour the epoxy. And I'm filling almost all of the knots and cracks on top of the slab, but if I was going to fill this big knot right here, it would look like a blob of epoxy. So I'm actually going to put a patch in this section using some of those offcuts from earlier. The difficult part here is that the grain is really wonky in this section, so I'm going to do the best I can to match it, but there's going to be no way to get that perfect. And honestly, I like it when you can see patches and bow tie inlays on table. Almost no live edge slab is perfect, so I actually like highlighting the imperfections with structural touches like this. But I'll let you guys be the judge and let me know in the comments if you think this looks good or if this totally ruins the table for you. And I get it. I know how picky some customers are. I mean, if you're going to spend serious money on a custom piece like this, you want it to your exact specifications. So I can only assume that everyone who hates on bow tie and lays or wood patches like this, it's because your tastes are so exact, so discerning, 
that you only have the finest unflawed custom one-of-a-kind furniture in your home and definitely not some garage sale find or hand-me-down table and all i can say is i envy you and i hope to be as fancy as all of you someday because i like imperfections but that's just me All right, now to glue these slabs together, and I'm only gonna use wood glue. I don't think people realize how strong wood glue is. Often, the wood itself will break before the glue joint breaks. And this whole thing is gonna be filled with epoxy, so it's gonna be strong enough. It's surprising just how strong it is without anything else but wood glue. Let's talk a minute about the charity I'm building this table for. It's called the Cats Moses Woodworkers with Disabilities Fund, and it's meant to empower those with physical and mental disabilities by providing them with resources to overcome those hurdles and get to enjoy the satisfaction and the pride that comes with building something for yourself. With that in mind, I'm building this table, I'm gonna list it for sale, but I'm not just building a table. I'm also gonna build an entire set of matching chairs to go with it. And then this whole dining set is gonna be listed for sale. And 100% of those proceeds are gonna to go to the Cats Moses Woodworkers with Disabilities Fund. And if you just wanna help out, I've got more information on how to do that below. If you wanna to give to the charity yourself or get involved, all that information is down below, as well as a link to Jonathan Katzmos' video where he goes into more detail about the charity and the work that they've done. And again, every year I build Katie a Christmas gift. Last year I built her the bed, but this year I'm building this table and chairs and then I'm donating the proceeds to the charity in her name, and that is gonna be her big gift. Now, I dropped a few subtle hints to Katie about this year's gift, but I'm pretty sure she has no idea what I'm doing. As a matter of fact, I suspect that she thinks that this table and chairs might end up in our house as the new dining set. And given that I built something big for her every year for Christmas, I can kind of see why she thinks that. It also doesn't help that I've been subtly suggesting that might be the case. And when this build is complete, I'll reveal that surprise and we'll just have to see how that plays out. All right, back to the build and I'm prepping the table for the first round of epoxy pours. And I want to take a second to address some comments that I got the last video. Actually, I got hundreds of responses from angry viewers over my environmentalist comments turning paper back into wood using epoxy. And I thought it was pretty clear that I was joking and in no way did I think that I was actually saving the environment by doing this. I was just poking a little fun at my own expense. I don't actually think building a table out of paper is helping the environment, but apparently, according to a lot of you fine folks, any epoxy table that I build will still be here 100 million years from now because epoxy never decomposes. So maybe if you look at it from kind of that perspective, maybe I am saving the environment by building tables that last for generations. Eons, actually. I mean, according to the responses that I got, some of my furniture may outlast humanity itself, and that sounds awesome. I mean, talk about a legacy. But all kidding aside, I listened to you when you said I shouldn't use paper to make a table, but rather use natural wood. So here I am using wood in the most natural way possible, once again proving that I am an environmentalist and I care about the planet. And no part of me thinks that we're already screwed. I definitely don't think massive corporations and governments polluting the planet are the real problem. I'm just saying let's all have some fun and laugh at ourselves a little and maybe make some cool stuff while we're still here. However long we get to be here. And if you want to build lasting furniture that stands the test of time for yourself, check out my link for totalboat.com where you'll get a discount on everything on the website every time you shop there as long as you use that link. You guys know that Total Boat has been my longest long time sponsor. And when you support my sponsors, you help support my channel. And as always, I appreciate that. Now, I did have one small leak on this 8-foot pour, and I'm trying out this flex tape for the first time, and this stuff is awesome. It's not as effective as the paste, but it's pretty good, it's less messy, and it's a lot quicker to use. Okay, okay let's talk about Kamiko, as I'm about to spend the next week of my life making all the Kamiko that goes into this table. Kamiko is an ancient Japanese woodworking technique dating back over a thousand years to the 7th century. It involves cutting and shaping small thin strips of wood to make geometric patterns that mostly resemble nature. And specifically, I'm making what's probably the most common Kamiko pattern, Asanoha, 
Asinoha is meant to represent a hemp flower, which was revered because hemp grows really fast and is really strong, so often you'd see this pattern stitched into the kimonos of children as a good omen for them to grow quickly and strong. And I've done Kamiko once before, like just one small little panel that I got, but now I have to create eight foot of Kamiko. So to tackle a project this large, I reached out to my good friend Johnny Trambukas of JT Woodworks. This guy is a Kamiko master. He has some insanely beautiful and intricate projects on his YouTube channel. Johnny actually sells a Kamiko making table saw sled and Kamiko jigs. So I bought these for myself to make all the Kamiko for this project. Again, Johnny's a great friend, a talented maker. So if you're interested in making Kamiko for yourself, you should check out his videos and his shop. This is in no way sponsored. I just want to support a friend. So definitely go check out Johnny's stuff. Now I'll have the link for that down below. Also, he has a cool name. A few years ago, I sold my Grizzly drum sander. I was in a smaller shop. It was taking up a bunch of space. I almost never used it. So I sold it to a friend for cheap with the promise that I could borrow it anytime I needed it. Well, it turns out I've needed that drum sander every day for every project since, and I very much regret selling it. So let this be a lesson to us all. Never get rid of anything, never sell off your tools, hoard everything, never throw anything away. And if your significant other has an issue with that, just tell them the sad tale of Johnny selling his drum sander and regretting it every day since. And now I have to make a 45 minute drive just to use this tool and I'll likely have to buy another one. I actually cut these a bit oversized, so running it through the drum sander kind of cleans up most of the burn marks and then flattens the strips to the proper width. This is that table saw sled that I bought from Johnny, and this is specifically for making the grids that the Kamiko is inlaid into. This allows me to quickly cut in half laps at a 30 degree angle once I get the blade height dialed in, and then I can batch out all the parts for the two grids. Now, it was a bit confusing trying to figure out the proper length of strips and how they would all fit together to make the panels big enough to fill the table voids. So I had to draw it out in the sketch up first as I'm very much a visual and hands-on learner. So basically, I had to build it on my computer first before building it in real life. Putting the grid together was pretty straightforward, but it did involve a lot of trial and error to get the width and the length of the panel that I needed using the size of strips that I cut. I just dry fit everything together and then come back and add glue to all the strips one by one. And these don't really need that much glue to stay together, but since I'm gonna fill this with epoxy, I didn't have to be super careful with the glue squeeze out and any mess that created. But imagine the real Kamiko artisans like Johnny Trambukas and how delicate and precise you have to be with adding the glue. I've seen them add glue using the very tip of a toothpick, just to add the tiniest dab without making a mess. Or even better, the Kamiko artisans that use no glue at all and everything is so precision fit that it just stays together by the friction of the tight joints. I don't have that sort of patience or time, but I can definitely admire those that go through this process in a more traditional way. It took me an entire day just to make two panels. And remember, this is the easy part of the build. Next, I have to cut and place in all the infill strips. And I think I underestimated just how much work this is gonna be. So I just counted, there are 58, I'll call them cells. Um, each one of these is a cell, there's 58. So we're gonna have to do uh, 58 of the cross pieces. Saw something that needs to be fixed real quick. Okay, so uh, when, when we install those cross pieces, that is going to essentially double the number of cells. So we'll go from 58 times two is 116. I knew that without having to use this because I did go to school at some point. That times three plus 58. So, <laughs> holy shit. On this panel, 406 pieces I need to make. <laughs> Remember when I th said I thought I'd be done with this tomorrow? and you laughed at me. Trabucus told me one of the most important things to remember is to always have a really sharp chisel. So I picked out three different chisels to sharpen so I could kind of find my preferred one. And if you're wondering, this here is the WorkSharp system. I have no affiliation with them and bought this myself, but I do think it's the quickest and most straightforward method of sharpening chisels. So I'll drop an Amazon link for this down below if you want to check it out. It's not cheap, but it's foolproof, as you can see by the fool currently using it. And my chisels need to be extra sharp since I'm making this out of hard maple. If I was just making this panel as a piece of art, I'd use basswood, which is 
is much softer and cuts much easier, but since I'm pouring epoxy over the panel, epoxy staining is a real concern. So that's why I'm using the maple, even though it's not the ideal wood to cut for this situation. First up, I'm making the strips that will separate the diamond shape and the grid into two triangles. And like I mentioned, this doubles the amount of infill strips needed to finish the pattern. This is one of the jigs that I bought from JT, and it's got an adjustable stop block and a six degree angle cut on one end. This is the guide for the chisel as I pair off the ends of the strips and cut them to size. And you might be looking at this thinking, you know, I can build that too if I had all your tools and jigs. And to that I'd say, you're exactly right. Making Kimiko isn't difficult, but doing it at this scale is extremely time consuming. And by this point, I'm starting to wonder how long this is gonna take me. Getting back to the slabs, I have a bunch of small knot holes and cracks to fill in the top. And being a burl slab, there's a couple hundred small holes to fill. So what I thought was going to be a quick break from working on the Kamiko turned into a few hours leaning over this table. And before my back completely gives out, maybe I should just invest in one of those adjustable height workbenches. If you guys have any good suggestions for the best one, make sure to drop a comment down below. All right, back to the Kamiko, and now I've got all those middle strips inlaid. This took a full day and a half of work, and now I've got to inlay three infill strips into over 200 triangles to create the Asanoha pattern, and I'm starting to get concerned about how I'm gonna be able to finish this project in time. So I hit up Johnny again, and he mentioned that Miles from Make With Miles used the drum sander in some of his Kamiko builds. So after doing a little bit of research, this is what I ended up with. What I've realized is if I keep using this, it's gonna take me approximately 27 years to finish this project. So I made an even quicker jig. This is a uh, 12 inch dish sander. So on this side, you've got one fence. This is actually the 30 degree fence. And then this wheel right here rotates this way. If you didn't have this piece right here, which stops it from flying off, this really heavy grit sandpaper is gonna grab it and just, it's gonna shoot it right out of your hands. You don't need the little stop block like you did on the other side. Again, the plate is rotating this way. And then I made this adjustable fence, which is the same kind of adjustable fence that you see on the actual Kamiko sled. And then I can just move this exactly where it needs to be, tighten this nut, and just have repeatable uh, pieces that I can batch out really quick. I still get comments to this day tell me I'm not a woodworker, and while I definitely like to have fun with those trolls, I can admit, maybe, that they're right. I wouldn't pigeonhole myself by saying that I'm a woodworker. I wanna use every tool and technique I possibly can to make the coolest shit I can possibly make, regardless of the material, whether I'm making something out of wood, making something with paper or with metal. The key word that I just said about a dozen times is make. I'm not a woodworker. I'm a maker, and I think to be a maker, all it requires is that you have a desire to make something, anything, whatever brings you happiness. I've been watching my oldest daughter, Chloe, make homemade candles for holiday gifts using jars that she found at thrift stores, and I love seeing how happy this has been making her. She is a maker. And if you like to make stuff too, I've got the perfect thing for you. The new Johnny Builds Maker shirt that you see me wearing throughout this video. Buying merch is a great way to support this channel, and I'm really proud of the two new t-shirt designs that I've added to my shop. Both were designed by my tattoo artist, Brandon Cutter, and they're both done in the American traditional tattoo style. So even if you're not into tattoos like I am, I think we can all agree American traditional art is really cool. So check out the new Maker shirt and the new Winged shirt. And as always, thank you for your support. This past year of doing Johnny Builds full time has been a dream come true. And I have all of you viewers out there to thank for making that possible. So thank you. And if you're not already subscribed and you enjoy watching my videos, please do so as it's the number one way to support what I do. And I appreciate each and every one of you who've done that so far. Even using the disc sander jig to make the Kamiko, this still took multiple days to finish. And a lot of those pieces that I made on the sander would have to get further refined using those original Kamiko jigs to get a perfect fit. But still, this beats hand cutting every piece. And finally, after about two weeks from the time that I started working on the Kamiko, I was done and nothing can stand in my way now. Hello darkness, my old friend. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
So I had to make another 45 minute trip to visit my old drum sander so I can flatten these panels. And if watching me send these to the drum sander gives you anxiety, imagine what I was feeling here. If I'm too aggressive, the drum sander is just gonna rip these panels apart. So I'm taking very light, very slow passes. And thankfully, not a single piece broke off during this process. Okay, back at the shop, the epoxy has had a few days to harden, and I can start the process of fitting Kamiko panels that I made into the two voids between the slabs. And I wanted this to be as accurate as possible. Now, technology has always been a part of woodworking and making. A hundred years ago, that technology was mostly hand tools, but fast forward to now, and it's amazing what technology is available that even a few years ago seemed out of reach. Okay, we've got all the Kamiko panels made, and now I have to inlay them into the slabs. And that's gonna be a little bit tricky because these voids, they're very organic, they're very oddly shaped. So it's really hard to get an accurate fit. So what I did was I went out and got a 3D scanner. This guy right here, this is the Shining 3D Einstar. It was recommended to me by a buddy, an Instagrammer, 3D DIY Dave. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to take a scan of the entire top of this slab. There's somewhat of an angle from the slabs on one side. So in order to allow the Kamiko to fit in there, I need to cut out a pocket essentially right along the edge. I've never used one of these. Uh, I just got it a week ago. I tested it like 20 minutes ago and I kind of got it to work, but we're going to wing it. I've never seen 3D scanning used in this way, but I can't think of a better way to map out the features of this table to inlay the Kamiko. And while that alone doesn't justify the expense of buying a $1,000 3D scanner like this, I have all sorts of ideas of how I can incorporate this technology into future builds to make some really unique pieces. So I feel like this is a good investment. And if it doesn't work out, scanning my friend's heads and 3D printing them makes the scanner a worthy investment by itself. Once this whole tabletop is scanned, I brought that 3D model into this design software where I can trace the outlines of the voids with a tool called a fit point spline. That drawing creates vector files and I need those vector files to carve out the recess into the slabs. But first I wanted to test the fit. So I'm gonna carve out a piece of half inch plywood and then I can lay that over the top of the table. And while I expected this to be kind of close, it was almost perfect. And right here, this gives me the confidence to go ahead and run the tool pass on the CNC on the real thing. And with this shot, you can get a better idea of why I needed to do this as it kind of cuts away that draft angle on the slabs and makes a 90 degree slot that I can place the Kamiko inside of. It also sort of makes a ledge for the Kamiko to rest on, but these panels won't be fully supported by that ledge. So I am gonna have to add some shim material. The other benefit to making the plywood panel first is I can use the offcuts or the center as templates for cutting the Kamiko to fill in the voids. So I wrap my pencil in blue tape to add an offset as I trace, and this accounts for the material lost by the quarter and CNC bit that cut out this shape. Now, my bandsaw needs a new blade and a tune-up. It's not working right now, so I went ahead and reached for my jigsaw to make these cuts. I definitely need to get my bandsaw running again because the jigsaw was not the right tool for the job. It vibrates and jumps around too much, causing lots of those little infill pieces to fall out and break off. So when I cut the second panel, I used that plywood template to better support the Kamiko and had way less issues with the pieces breaking off. And fortunately, this is a pretty easy fix. I just glued back in the pieces that fell out with some super glue. Like I mentioned a bit ago, I need some shim stock to support the Kamiko panels as they're inlaid into the voids. Part of the panels are supported by the ledge that carved in, but these wood blocks support the remainder of the Kamiko panels, and each one has to be sized precisely so that the Kamiko is flush with the top. This whole section is getting filled with epoxy, so I'm just going to use some CA glue to hold the strips down for now, and then some CA glue to adhere the panels in place on top of the strips. And seeing the panels go into the voids for the first time, this was really exciting. I had a vision for how this piece would come out, but seeing it happen in real time is extremely gratifying given how long this project is taking. Now there's no need to put the whole table back into the form yet, so I'll just seal up the ends and prep this for the epoxy pores filling up the voids around the Kamiko. And even with having the panels glued down, I was concerned about them floating up during the pores, so I went ahead and added some HDPE blocks clamped across the top for extra insurance. Thank you. 
So I said I was gonna build a set of chairs to go with this table, and I definitely will have a set of six matching chairs for whoever buys the table. But given how much time I've already spent working on the table, I decided to only build one chair for the video. And I'm building that chair from one inch square tube steel. Now cutting here on my grizzly metal bandsaw, which by the way, this might be my favorite tool in the shop. I used to hate cutting steel because it's really messy and usually you're dodging shards of steel coming off the cut, but this tool is such a breeze to use and even cutting in the angles needed for the various chair parts is simple because that head swivels. Now, I'm not a professional welder, not by a long shot, but the great thing about welding is you don't have to be perfect. I mean, a lot of welders will insist that, oh, it has to be perfect, but we're not welding pipeline here. We're not doing something that, you know, has to be extremely structural sound. You know, I'm making a chair. Now, having the right welder is really important, and this Lincoln Electric 215 multiprocess welder has really stepped up my welding game tremendously, and I feel like for a lot of people, welding is a scary technique to learn, but I promise you, it's really simple, and nothing is cooler than sticking metal together to make something functional. Also, I finally got my Avid Plasma table up and running, so I had it cut out a steel Kamiko panel, and I'll weld that onto the back of the chair so that all matches the table. Now, for the seat and the backrest, I'm going to make these out of red oak which I have to first glue up the seat panel. And for the backrest, I'm stacking these curves that I'll cut on the CNC. And once that glue is dry on the panel, I brought it over to the CNC where I'm gonna carve in the seat relief for what is more commonly known as the butt scoop. And this is what makes a wooden seat comfortable, carving in the butt scoop to contour to the sitter's posterior. And if you buy this table and you want an extra custom touch and for an extremely large upcharge, I will fly out to you on the first class ticket that you provide me and personally 3D scan your rump to create your own personal one of a kind butt scoop, which has never been done before in chair making history. So yeah, that 3D scanner already paying for itself. And to attach the seat back and the backrest, I plasma cut these tabs, which I'll then weld to the chair. But first I need to score them along their center line so I can place these in the vise and then hammer in a 90 degree angle before welding them onto the chair. So there's a saying that goes, Bondo and paint make me the welder I ain't. And while that's not really the best use of English grammar, it is true, as Bondo is absolute magic at hiding imperfections in metalworking. It smells awful, and I'm pretty sure it's taking years off my life, even though I'm wearing a respirator, but it's really easy to use, and in less than an hour, this chair is ready to paint. And given that this is just the prototype chair for the set, I'll just use rattle cans to paint it, and then I finished it with this jumbo can of black gloss enamel. After some finish sanding on the wooden parts, I can add Rubio Monocoat to finish them and put the whole chair together. I also picked up some brass screws and decorative washers as these screws are going to be exposed on the top of the backrest. And finally, with the chair done, I'm loving the way it came out. So it's not too heavy where it's not functional, but it's heavy enough to be annoying to slide it and out. So I decided that for the buyer of this table, I'll build an entire set of wooden chairs. I'll use the same design, but they'll be wooden and they'll be lighter and I think that'll be better. And by this point, I'm almost done with the build as I have just a few more steps to put the table all together. And I don't know why, but every single project, I think it's gonna take way less time than what it actually does. And after making more than a hundred of these videos, I still always underestimate the amount of time I need to build something. And to let you all in on a bit of behind the scenes knowledge, I end up sort of hating the project by the last stages of building it. So that's exactly where I am now as I get out the table base that I'm using which is an absolute stunner of a piece that I got from Flowy Line Design. This is the large tulip base in gold. And the thing that really fascinates me about this Flowy Line base is I have no idea how they made it. It's welded steel, but I don't fully understand how they shape and mold all the complex curves. Nothing on this thing is flat or angular except for the bottom. It's all swooping curves, and I just can't quite wrap my mind around how they put it together unless they're using massive metal stamping machines and tooling. I actually doubt that's the case, but it just leaves me scratching my head. Regardless, this table base is beautiful, and it's really going to elevate this piece from just being another epoxy table to an absolute showpiece for whoever buys it. All right, we just flipped this thing over, and with the base on, it looks... Absolutely incredible. I am 
So excited, I cannot wait to show you. Uh, wait, uh, 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 hold on. <laughs> we'll show you at the end. I don't wanna reveal it yet. I still have a couple things to do. I've gotta sand, I've gotta put on finish, but by the end of the day, I think, Andy, we'll be done. Do you guys remember back in the 80s, there was a trend where a bunch of big stars would get together and make a huge body over the top song for a very specific cause? Of course, the most famous of those was We Are The World by a collection of musicians calling themselves USA for Africa. And in We Are The World, everybody from Michael Jackson, Paul Simon, Tina Turner, Willie Nelson, Lionel Richie, Stevie Wonder, Bob Dylan, Cindy Lauper, Ray Charles, for some reason, Dan Aykroyd, who is neither a singer or from the US, was there. And of course, my nemesis, Bruce Springsteen, ugh. and so many more artists belted out some really cheesy lyrics to try to fight starvation in Africa. And where am I going with all this? Believe it or not, I have a point here. While working on a one-of-a-kind project, I used so many different tools and techniques. I used chisels, mallets, a track saw, table saw, miter saw, planer, joiner, my CNC, I welded, I glued, I clamped, I poured epoxy, I learned how to use a 3D scanner, I called on a friend for a belt sander, flowy line design did the base, I bought custom sleds and jigs from JT Woodworks, I used pieces of wood I've never used before that came from halfway across the country, I made Kamiko panels that Japanese woodworkers have been making for over a thousand years, I cut steel with a tool that turns gas into plasma, plasma you guys, the fourth state of matter. Anyway, the point I'm making is that I took a collection of skills and materials as vastly different from one another as Michael Jackson is from Huey Lewis, and I made something I'm extremely proud of. And while this might not bring in $63 million for charity like that dumb song did, it will put tools in the hands of some really great people that could use the help. And I have a feeling that my wife Katie is going to feel the same way I do, but let's go find out. A little threshold. Don't trip. You have the baby. Don't trip. I'm going to get you situated turn you towards the mystery item. Your big gift this year. This table is mine? No, you don't get to keep the table. I don't get it. I built this to sell, and then 100% of the proceeds are going to the Cats Moses Woodworkers with Disabilities Fund, and I'm making that donation in your name. Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. <laughs> so that is your Christmas gift. Did you hear what <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so sweet. But I do have a little surprise for you. So, you know, I made this chair, right? It's the Kamiko chair. Have a seat. When I actually build the set of chairs for whoever buys this table, I've decided that metal isn't the way to go. So this chair is yours. <gasps> I get this chair? You can have the chair. What do you think, lady? What do you think, baby girl? So at the end of a project, if I can say that I learned something, that I stretched myself, I got better, then it was worth it. And like I've been lovingly told down in the comments section, epoxy never deteriorates, never decomposes. And my hope is that this table never ends up in a landfill because the person who buys it values it too much to just toss it out. And really, is that a thing where people are just throwing away tables into landfills? I don't know. But anyways, the real value for me in this project is not the expense of wood. It's not the labor that I put into it. It's not even all the techniques new and old that were used to build this one of a kind table. The real reason it's valuable is that it's gonna go to help someone else. As I mentioned before, the Lambert family is donating 100% of the proceeds made from the sale of this table to the Cats Moses Woodworkers with Disabilities Fund. So as proud as I am of the table itself, I'm more proud of the legacy it's gonna leave behind. And P.S. Bruce Springsteen still sucks. Yeah. What's that? The camera. Hi, you're gonna, you're gonna smile for the camera or you're just gonna...